It gives me great honor to be here uh, this morning to participate in this important conference. And I want to express my sincere gratitude to TTTI uh, for extending an invitation to me to be part of this conference. It's a great honor for me, and I'm glad to be among distinguished men and women who share a common goal of finding permanent solutions to the global challenge of corruption. I bring you greetings from equally warm Zambia. When my friend and brother Dion Abdul, the chair of TTTI, extended an invitation to me, I gladly accepted, although we've been talking for two years, that I should be part of this conference. And it's because the reputation of this conference as a meeting of serious minds who are willing to explore and devise strategies uh, to address the pertinent challenges of our times precedes it. When I was preparing to come to uh, Trinidad and Tobago, my youngest son, our youngest son of 16 years, was also visiting. So when he heard I'm coming to Trinidad and Tobago, he asked me, are you going to see where Nicki Minaj and Candy B come from? <laughs> and I had no idea who these are, so I asked him, are these politicians? And he said, no, Daddy, why does it all have to be about politics? So said, well, I can also ask you, do you know Brian Lara and Karim Abdul-Jabbar? He says, no, I don't know them. I said, yes, they are sportsmen. So there's a world between you and I. So I'm here to, this morning as part of Transparency International because we take pride in the good work that chapters such as TTI are doing and we would like to use the work of local chapters to feed into our global advocacy program. We are interested, therefore, in the outcomes of this conference, and we will share the outcomes uh, widely across the 102 countries where we have a presence. The theme, Crackdown on Corruption Facing Reality, is not only timely, but relevant to this country and many others, including Zambia, where I come from. I've taken time to reflect on, this, on the theme and I'll share a few thoughts uh, with you this morning. I consider that there are two limbs to the theme, namely cracking down on corruption and facing the reality as it relates to the first. The first limb of the theme, crack down on corruption, is not only a clarion call to action, it is a pointer to the ever increasing corruption levels around the world. Today, it can be said without any doubt that corruption is alive and well. Countries, communities, and organizations, as well as individuals, suffer the direct and indirect consequences of not only petty corruption, but collusion, trading in influence, political patronage, nepotism, state capture, and grand corruption. For a number of countries, there are consequences of this corruption. It is frightening to note that the state of corruption may become worse in years to come. We all know that corruption disproportionately affects the poor and vulnerable, the minority and marginalized, women and children. Corruption is not a victimless crime. And I want to underscore that. It's not a victimless crime. Where corruption happens, there are victims. Corruption deprives this generation and those to come of a future. On the political front, corruption is a major obstacle to democracy and the rule of law. In a democratic setup, officers and institutions lose their legitimacy when they are misused for private advantage. Economically, corruption depletes national wealth. Corrupt politicians invest case public resources in projects that will line their pro pockets rather than benefit communities. And they prioritize high profile projects such as dams, power plants, uh, pipelines, and refineries over less spectacular but more agent infrastructure projects such as schools, hospitals, and roads. Corruption erodes the social fabric of society. It undermines people's trust in the political system, in its institutions, and in its leadership. A distrustful or apathetic public can become yet another challenge in fighting corruption. Despite this knowledge and awareness of corruption and its manifestations, we continue to witness its uninhibited growth in our societies. 
human ingenuity, intellectualism, and industry has successfully managed to solve some of the world's greatest challenges. We've addressed epidemics as well as calamities. We've defied the odds and conquered space, and new technologies will see the human race push the envelope further. However, insofar as corruption is concerned, we are not on track to find lasting solutions to the omnipresent crime. And one reason for this could be the sad reality that corruption is driven and thrives because of individual greed and selfishness. For some, including those with power and authority to bring about change, the personal benefits of corruption outweigh the public good. I do conclude, therefore, that it is inevitable for the great people of Trinidad and Tobago and those of my own country and the rest of the world to intensify our efforts to crack down on corruption. We can no longer sit back and allow this scourge to define us, to shape us, and ultimately to destroy us. It is possible that this conference will sufficiently motivate us and equip us with the knowledge to go out and crack down on corruption. But we need to appreciate that our work is conducted in the existing operating environment, fraught with a number of shortcomings and limitations. Some of these limitations are obvious, such as the lack of adequate policy and legal frameworks, weak institutional capacity of key bodies and poor funding. However, there are many other nuances and realities which need to be noted. We can only craft credible strategies for this venture if we understand the realities which define the lay of the land we work in. I do attempt, therefore, in considering the second limb of the theme, facing the reality, to address some of the perspectives of the realities which are relevant in many contexts and may be of relevance to Trinidad and Tobago. The first reality I'd like to point out is what I call problem identification. In our work as Transparency International, we have studied and observed that in many countries, the magnitude of the problem of corruption, as well as the types of corruption which are most prevalent, is not well understood by many stakeholders. Corruption is not an easy subject to identify and address, and for most countries, corruption takes several forms and affects many sectors. The problems of corruption, if not properly framed, do not attract the right response, whether policy or legal response, and usually these are tentative and may not be the right ones. And in a number of instances, governments and stakeholders respond to the symptoms and not the causes of corruption. The reality, however, is that corruption has become complex and sophisticated. Every day we encounter new forms of corruption, and some of these are linked to equally complex criminal activities like organized crime, money laundering, or terrorism. We're encountering corruption in land management, in the extractive industry, in defense spending, in pharmaceutical and health, in education, in water and sanitation, in climate governance, and the list goes on. Corruption has not spared our electoral regimes, and in many jurisdictions, the main weakness of the electoral process lies with the ease with which processes of corruption shape the elections. And subsequently, not all leaders are elected on the strength of their character or capacity to, to deliver. Rather, the elections are decided on the depth of their pockets to buy the elections. Corruption is equally prevalent in political parties themselves. And it is ironic, if not tragic, to find an inherently corrupt political party seeking the people's vote to form and run a clean government. One area which brings its own complexities is public procurement. Globally, trillions of dollars are spent each year buying goods and services for public projects. From schools and hospitals to power plants and dams, public procurement means big budgets and complex plans. But it also comes with ideal opportunities for corruption. In, in countries with poor public uh, procurement uh, regulations, contracts to suppliers are awarded without fair competition. This usually allows companies with political connections to triumph over rivals. Corruption in public procurement increases the cost of services to the public. And corruption in public procurement at times 
is a source of funds which illegally go to campaign financing. I know that Prof will be speaking shortly from Canada, and I'm sure she'll mention more about campaign financing. However, corruption in public procurement is not only about money. It also reduces the quality of work or services. It can cost lives. For instance, people in many countries have paid a terrible personal price for collapsed buildings or their health compromised from consuming counterfeit medicines. The reality is that we are dealing with a problem which has many sides to it and is becoming complex by the day. Therefore, to successfully crack down on corruption, we need to have a good diagnosis of the problem. The second reality I wish to share is what I call denial of the problem. Notwithstanding the challenges of problem identification, it is our observation in Transparency International that many countries, especially those that are perceived to be highly corrupt, in those countries, political and community leaders and at times individual citizens are in denial of the existence of the problem of corruption. Quite often when allegations of corruption are made, those in authority and have the mandate to do something about corruption respond rather dismissively. Those who raise such allegations are often derided. They are threatened and accused of lacking patriotism by seeking to paint the country black. This denial mentality is not confined to the public sector. We have also witnessed private businesses which do not want to admit they have a problem that needs to be urgently addressed. The final act of denial which we in Transparency International see whenever we launch the Corruption Perception Index is a government calling on those raising allegations of corruption to provide cogent evidence of this corruption. This is an elected government with the instruments of power and institutions mandated to investigate and prosecute corruption, asking ordinary citizens to provide evidence. Two years ago, during the International Anti-Corruption Day, our Republican president came to address the gathering. And as per tradition, I was asked to speak on behalf of my chapter. So I said to the president, and the president the week before had just been saying, give me evidence of the corruption among my ministers. So I said to the president, Mr. President, you get back home the time before you were in state house, when you are an ordinary citizen like us, you get back home and your neighbor walks up to you and he says, I saw what looks like a snake enter in your house. And you look at your neighbor and say, can you give me evidence that what you saw enter in my house is a snake and not a lizard? Do you think that that would be the right response? And don't you do the uh, most rational thing to get in the house, look for the snake if it's there and kill it? Or if you do not find the snake, close all loopholes which would allow the snake to get into your house. Of course, the president being firstly a politician and a lawyer, thought he would have one up on me. So when he was speaking, he said, yes, if a snake has entered my house, you as a good neighbor should come and uh, search for the snake uh, with me. <laughs> so afterwards I was telling him, well, yes indeed, as a good neighbor, I should come and help you search for the snake. But if a snake has entered your bedroom, it is you first to invite me to come to your bedroom and search for the snake. So the impression has been created that when allegations of corruption are raised, especially those targeting members of the government or ruling party, these are simply frivolous and vexatious. This is usually a hypocritical position taken because when these allegations of corruption are made against political opponents, we see members of the ruling party and government leaders taken to the mountaintops to denounce this corruption even without the necessary evidence. This denial of the existence of corruption gives governments and organizations a veneer of comfort that all is well. But the reality we should be painfully aware of is that procrastination to openly, urgently, and boldly deal with the corruption of today is basically to delay actions which in the fullness of time will have devastating consequences on our society. Our inertia to act now will certainly manifest in negative ways in the near future. 